In most Unity projects, the built-in physics system does exactly what you need. Rigid bodies bounce, slide, and collide like you'd expect. But what if you want to do something different? What if you want an object that only collides from one side, or a surface that acts like a conveyor belt without actually moving? Unity has a powerful hook into the physics solver, the ability to directly modify collision contacts as they're happening, even while the solver is running in parallel across threads. In this video, we're going to have an overview of how to use that system to create custom collision logic. Let's get into it. Okay, let's start with a really simple example. One use case for this API is moving an object along a surface, just like a conveyor belt. We could set a vector 3 for the direction and strength of the conveyor force, and another vector 3 to say where we're going to spawn objects in world space above the conveyor. Then let's define a radius around where the conveyor effect will actually be applied. I've already made a prefab up for objects we can spawn onto the conveyor. Then let's come down and we'll create an onEnable method. Let's spawn the ball and we'll move it to its starting position. Let's make sure that our ball has a sphere collider and we're going to enable modifiable contacts. This tells Unity that we want to receive contact modification data involving this collider. After this, we can subscribe to Unity's contact modification event. This is called during the physics solve phase and runs on worker threads. We'll write a callback method for this in just a second, but first in onDisable, Let's make sure that we deregister for this event. Now we can write a delegate for Unity's contact modify event. Unity calls this during the contact resolution phase of the physics step before normal collision response happens. This will bring in two arguments. The first one is the physics scene. In most cases, if you're using the default scene, this can just be ignored, but it might be useful if you're running physics manually or potentially even handling multiple worlds. The other one is a thread safe performance optimized array containing all the contact pairs that you're allowed to modify. Each modifiable contact pair represents a collision between two colliders that includes one or more contact points. There's a lot we can do with each contact point. As we iterate over these, we could get each of these contact points with the getPoint method. Then we could check to see whether or not it's within the range of our conveyor zone radius. If we want to take some action here, there's all kinds of things we could do. Each pair has a lot of getters and setters, so you can get the normal, the bounciness, the point, etc. It also has a lot of setters, so you can set its bounciness, change its normal, or in this case, we're going to set the target velocity. So for this particular contact point, I'm going to set its velocity to that of the conveyor direction. This is about the simplest example we can possibly do to get started here. So let's jump back into Unity and see how it works. So I've set up a shader here that's going to act as our conveyor. This is from a brand new asset on the store from one of my favorite creators. I'm actually using it for quite a few different shaders in this scene, including the skybox. I'll leave a link to this in the description. So this shader is just scrolling a texture over and over. What I want to do is drop an object onto it, and when it collides with the plane, I want it to start moving in the same direction as the texture is scrolling. I've set up a sphere we can spawn as well, and made it a little bit more exciting than just a boring sphere. The child object here has the particle effects, but the parent has the collider and the rigid body. If I come out of here and press play, we'll see it drop down onto the conveyor, and as soon as it's made contact, and as long as it maintains that contact, we're adjusting its velocity so it moves along. And you see once it falls off the conveyor and onto the normal floor, it has some momentum, but it's not being affected by the contact points anymore. Now I had its velocity being adjusted to a 5 here, which actually matches what I had set in the shader. But what if I update the conveyor direction to just be vector 3.0? Our sphere will land in the middle of the plane again, but this time we're affecting its velocity with vector 3.0, so it's just going to stay right in the very center. Let's take a look at a slightly more complicated example. Let's suppose that we have a wall or a barrier that we want some objects to be able to pass through, but only in one direction. We can make this a public property so that we can change it inside of the inspector. But here we'll say that objects can pass through the wall from the negative Z axis going towards the positive Z axis. We can also set a spawn position to be right in front of the barrier. And once again, we'll use our ball prefab. In our awake method, we can start by making sure that the pass direction is normalized because we're going to use it to calculate the dot product. 
Then we can instantiate our ball, set its position to be the spawn position. Then we can give it an initial linear velocity of a vector three dot forward multiplied by some force. Just like we did before, we're going to affect its collider by changing the has modifiable contacts to be true. Then we can hook into the contact modify event again, and we're all done with awake. We'll also make an on destroy method where we deregister for that event. Now we can write our delegate method. This will be very similar to our first example. Let's iterate over all of the modifiable contact pairs. Each one can have multiple contacts, so let's iterate over those as well. For each one, let's get the normal, then we can get the dot product to determine which direction the collision is happening from. If our dot product is greater than zero, then for this pair, we can choose to ignore contact. This will effectively allow the object to pass through the barrier. Let's jump back into Unity and see how this works. Here I've set my red glowy barrier to have a box collider, and I've set on our script the pass direction to be 1. If I press play, the projectile will fire at the barrier and of course just falls to the ground and with a little bit of momentum is rolling backwards. If I change the pass direction to be the inverse, so minus 1, now when I press play, the projectile will pass directly through the barrier and just keep going right over the edge of the world. Now one thing about this example is that the ball will ignore collisions with any collider it touches from the allowed pass through direction. Let's take a look at a more advanced use case where we're going to start filtering on these contacts. To follow along with this example, you're going to want to install a new package using NuGet for Unity, and that package is concurrent hash set. Unity has other concurrent collection types, such as concurrent dictionary. So if you don't want to bring in a specific concurrent hash set type, you can use concurrent dictionary using the keys to be its own hash set. You're going to need some kind of concurrent collection if you want to collect any data inside of these delegates because they are multi-threaded. So in this example, I want to know which triangles of a mesh I'm actually hitting with an object. This way, based on all kinds of conditions, I can make changes to the mesh that's being impacted. Since I'm going to use the concurrent hash set, I'm going to add a using statement here for concurrent collections. Now let's start adding some references for things that we need. First of all, I'm going to have a mesh that represents a terrain, and I'm going to continue using the same ball that I've been using in the previous examples. From our terrain prefab, I'm going to want to get a reference to its mesh and its mesh collider, and we're going to store its collider ID. Now, while Unity is calling our delegate function when it's trying to resolve collisions, I want it to store data in my concurrent hash set of type uint. That's going to represent all of the different triangles on our terrain that get hit by our obstacle. In our awake method, we can do some setup. I'm going to instantiate that terrain prefab and make sure it's at the world center. I'm going to store a reference to its mesh and a reference to its mesh collider. Then we can also store the ID of its mesh collider. This is going to let us distinguish between when we hit this terrain or hit any other object in the scene. For the ball, we can just instantiate it, set it to a position above the terrain, and we'll set has modifiable contacts equals to true again. Now we're ready to hook into the contact modify event, and as per usual on destroy, we'll just deregister as well. I'll just quickly collapse everything up so that we've got a bit more room. So now for our delegate method, once again, we're going to iterate over all of the modifiable contact pairs, but this time we're only going to consider contact pairs involving the terrain collider. We can check against collider instance ID and other collider instance ID here to see if one of those in the pair belong to the terrain. We could have taken this a step further and also stored an ID for the ball. And alternatively, you can do the same thing with rigid body instance IDs. This kind of filtering inside of the delegate is not only good for performance, but it allows you to, for example, maybe have only some objects will impact the terrain and not others. But for now, we can say that if one of the objects in the pair wasn't the terrain, we're just going to continue in our loop. Now we can iterate over all of the contacts in the pair. We can get the triangle index in the mesh that was touched, record it in our thread safe set for processing in fixed update later on. Now, optionally, we can also ignore the contact so that it just continues right through the mesh. So now we have a collection of all the faces on the mesh that were touched. Inside a fixed update, we can do whatever we want with that information. I'll just collapse this up for a clean slate, and we can write a fixed update method. In here, if the touch triangle's hash set is empty, let's just bail out early. 
Let's make a copy of our concurrent collection into a normal list, and then we'll clear out the concurrent collection so that we don't reprocess it next frame. Now for this example, I'm actually going to remove those faces from the mesh. So let's have a new list of triangles that we're going to build. And let's also keep a list of all the original triangle indices of the mesh. Now we can iterate over all the triangles in the mesh. And as we know, there's going to be three points for each one. Now we can check to see if this triangle was touched. We're just going to skip it, i.e. we're going to remove it. So we'll just continue. Otherwise, we're going to keep the triangle. So in our updated triangles collection, we're going to add all three points that we need. Finally, when we're done iterating over all the triangles, let's replace the meshes triangle list with the updated one. Now, after a topology change like this, we need to recalculate the normals and recalculate the bounds. And then we can force Unity to update the mesh collider with the modified mesh. To do that, first set the shared mesh to be null then set the shared mesh to be the mesh that you want. OK, let's jump back to Unity and see how this works. I think I'll start the game pause so we get a good idea of what's about to happen. So here we can see the balls spawned ready to drop. And if I unpause the game, it'll fall right through that mesh and take out any triangles that it comes into contact with. In fact, if I look at this inside of my inspector window, you can see there's a gaping hole right where that ball went right through the mesh. Now, of course, you could use this information for all kinds of things, not just removing triangles, but maybe you could have an impact crater or you could change the vertex colors if you wanted. And that's kind of the beauty of this API. It gives you a lot more creative control of what's going on with your contacts because you have access to all of the contact points right at the point where Unity is resolving them. So I encourage you to go and check out all of the different methods and things that you could do using this API. But that's as far as we're going to go with this in this video. Don't forget to join us on Discord. We're having a few more asset giveaways this week. Hit the like and subscribe button for more content like this every Sunday. I'll throw another video up on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.